Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. John the Baptist appeared preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his kingdom, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. You, Today we uh, continue our observance of uh, Advent, a time of waiting for the Lord, and we hear about John the Baptist, who was the one who, who becomes a kind of a figure of waiting. He becomes an, an image or a kind of an icon of someone who's waiting for the Lord and waiting for him in the right way, doing what's supposed to be done as one waits. And that is, that's described fairly concisely in today's gospel. He talks about repenting for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's, uh, he's talking about making straight the way of the Lord. Well, those are, those are exactly what we ought to be doing. We ought to be repenting, changing, uh, and making straight the way. Making straight the way within the world by trying to you know, call people to the gospel, but also make straight the way within ourselves by, by being conformed to, by, by receiving God's word more and more generously, by being transformed by it more totally, um, and then becoming instruments whereby we can effectively witness to the truth of the gospel and bring others to believe, kind of convert the world, uh, do our small modest part to convert the world, um, and, and, and do our small, modest part in, again, preparing a welcome for Christ, aware that he can, he can come at any moment, perhaps sooner than we imagine. And this is, this is the figure of John the Baptist. Um, John is, um, it's an, he's an interesting figure. You know, I don't, uh, um, he's, he's out there in the desert li living this incredibly ascetical life. And he's preaching this kind of fiery, uh, warning to the people around him. You know, the, 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 um, uh, the axe is at the root already, and uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and his winnowing fan is in his hand. The winnowing fan is an instrument of the harvest. It's an instrument of sifting out the wheat and the chaff. Um, and so John's expectation is that there's going to be a fiery judgment, and it's going to be in its imminent. Um, and I have to wonder, based on what goes on later in the gospel, whether or not John regarded his expectation as having been met. You know, at one point, John actually sends, John is in prison, so he can't go and talk to Christ himself. John is imprisoned by King Herod, and eventually he's executed by King Herod. 
but John sends emissaries to Christ. In, in, a, in an episode that's, that's described in the gospel, John sends two, uh, two of his own disciples to, to Jesus and asks, are you the one to come or is there another? And with, that's kind of surprising because at this moment, John seems pretty confident that Christ is the one who's going to accomplish all of the last things. But John seems a little less confident. It's as though, you know, the way that Christ has come, uh, you know, humble in a manger, and then preaching a gospel of repentance, forgiving sinners, uh, doing miracles, but miracles of healing. You know, nothing, nothing as impressive as what you hear as, uh, as, as associated with the end of the world. You know, mountains crashing into the sea and valleys being filled up and so on. And great portents in the sky. The, the sort of miracles that Jesus is performing are pretty, are, pr are pretty small compared to that sort of thing. Or at least from one perspective at least. Uh, it's as though John has, to John has to reconsider his own expectation. Maybe he begins to lose confidence that Christ is in fact the one. That, that John has a very definite expectation as to, as, to the, as to the form that Jesus will take. And when that, isn't, when that isn't met, you know, John has to kind of change a little bit. And I suppose that that's, this, this points to something that's true of every disciple. We all await Christ. We all await Jesus but we can't be confident that he will take the form that we expect. You know, our own notions of, of who Christ is and of course what he represents, goodness, truth, and justice, um, we, we have to have some, some humility uh, that, that, uh, that our expectation is a little off. And I think that that's, that's uh, a part of that realization, that humble realization that we might require a kind of a correction regarding our understanding of goodness, justice, and love, regarding those lofty ideals, uh, has to undergo a kind of a correction, a purification, if you will. And this is what, again, the, the work of making straight the way of the Lord, the humble realization that we might not be the best judge of these things, that we might be in the dark on these things, or at least confused, prone to error, and therefore in need of correction. And this is what I think is the this is what the, the life of, of humility is all about, and also the life of, of trying to understand better Christ's own message and what the church teaches, and how the church teaches is an extension of Christ's own message. And, and examining that in a humbler way, in a, in a more docile way, uh, humility is, is, our, is our guardian against self-deception. You know, um, one of the miracles that Christ performs kind of consistently throughout the gospel is healing the, healing the blind. And blindness is a, is a, is a, is a terrible uh, disability. Um, it's common, far more common in the ancient world, I suppose, than it is now because of our, our uh, medical technology. But still a, still a terrible affliction, of course. But we see that, that blind people, paradoxically, see their own blindness. Uh, blind people see their own blindness, and, and because of that, take precaution against their, their blindness. You know, they'll walk with those canes that they have, or you hear the, the beeping things going off on the street corners that tell blind people when it's safe to cross. You know, blind people know that they're in danger of walking out into the street and being hit by a car, or just tripping on something and getting hurt and so on. So they take these precautions against their own disability. But spiritual blindness is a little bit different, or it's different in a, in a profound way. The spiritually blind often don't know that they're blind. They, the spiritually blind don't know that they're confused. And we have to have uh, the humble realization that we might be afflicted in this way. And so the life of humility, the life of docility, and dare I say it, the, the, the dirty word that our, our own time will not, uh, will not tolerate, our obedience is the way in which we guard ourselves against our own spiritual blindness. The blindness that we don't see, but which we are fools to imagine is not working on us, is not skewing the way we view the world. At one point, there's a, a story in the gospel where uh, Christ uh, heals a blind man, but only halfway. And he heals the blind man in such a way that he says, oh, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Uh, he, he, he sees a little bit better, but according to his vision, pe the people aren't fully human. He sees that they're persons, but doesn't see their full personality. Um, but then, then Christ completes the miracle, and then, he's, then he sees people clearly. He sees them as people. 
Well, this, this kind of physical progress in this man's vision is a metaphor for the spiritual progress that we are to make, the, the progress in spiritual vision that we are to accomplish by our reception of Christ's word and example, his truth and goodness in a more profound way. We know that the people in our lives are, are people like ourselves, but do we really see that all the way? Do we treat the people in our lives as though they are other selves? That the golden rule is so simple. Treat another person as you would, as you would have yourself be treated. Uh, but do we follow through on that? Does our action betray? Uh, uh, does our indifference to the suffering of those around us? Uh, uh, does our egotism and narcissism betray the fact that we don't see that fully? That people are like ourselves and are worthy of what we would have done to us? Again, this is the... This tells us about the transformation that Christ wants to effect within us, to, to move beyond uh, this spiritual blindness, to see the world ever more clearly. All through the Gospels, the image of light is given. And of course, during Advent, we talk about this a lot. The, and at Christmas time, the beautiful image of the star shining in the darkness, guiding the wise men to Christ will be put before us. And we will hear from the prophet Isaiah, a people walking in darkness has seen a great light. All the while, we should be asking Christ for more light, presuming that, the, that there is perhaps more darkness in us than we suspect, presuming humbly that we are in need of more conversion and repentance than we are presently aware. The, one of the beautiful prayers of the church is to ask God to reveal the faults that are within us and which are hidden. Um, this is uh, John the Baptist was doing his very best, embracing a life of asceticism, embracing a life of self-denial. And perhaps, and, and he began to confront, even, even he began to uh, realize that perhaps his picture of Christ was in need of modification and changing. He was beginning to realize that perhaps his picture was in need of, of some measure of, of correction. At another instance in the gospel, um, Christ refers to John as the, the, the friend of the bridegroom. And this kind of suggests to us a, a, a marital imagery. Um, and this goes back into the Old Testament. You know, the, the prophet Hosea referred to God as the bridegroom and Israel as the bride. So there was this beautiful uh, image of love and intimacy that, su that suggested between God and his, and his chosen people. And in the, in the New Testament, all of this gets kind of transferred onto Christ and his disciples, or Christ and the church. The church is the bridegroom, and the, or the, rather the church is the bride, and Christ is the bridegroom. And we see in the Eucharist, we see Christ is still giving his body and blood to his bride. So the, the Mass has always been thought of as a kind of a wedding banquet. But if you think about um, a wedding, a marriage, the, 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 the decisive moment of a wedding is, of course, the yes, or the, in TV, it's always the I do. In TV and movies, it's the, I, in the Catholic ceremony, that's not really, that's not how it works, but, uh, but, the, but the vow is the, is, the, is, the, is the dramatic high point of the, of the wedding. And you're wondering out there, will they go through with it? No, most often not, but, but, the, uh, um, but, the, but that yes to each other, that, that, that embrace of the other, the, the, the yes to one's spouse, uh, is meaningless if it isn't accompanied by a great many no's. If you aren't willing to say no to every other possibility, the yes doesn't mean anything. And that, I think, is what uh, John the Baptist's asceticism is all about. His self-denial, his, his, uh, his fasting, uh, his asceticism, uh, his, his willingness to give himself to the service of God's word and God's law, his willingness to subordinate himself so radically to Christ, you know, when he says, he must increase and I must decrease. This, this saying no to himself is all in the service of this larger and more luminous yes. And I think that as we contemplate the life of humility, the life of denying ourselves, the life of reigning in our own judgment, the life of admitting that we might be confused, that our understanding of, of the world and our place in it might require correction, this, this no saying and this humility. During this season of Advent, I think we can see all the more clearly that all of this self-denial is for the sake of a more profound and loftier yes. It's not for the sake of, of crushing ourselves away or, or, or discarding ourselves. Uh, it's all for the sake of embracing Christ with a more sincere and more full yes. 
This is what the whole season of Advent is all about. The, the time of, of prayer and preparation is all oriented towards Christmas, when humanity receives the Lord, receives his justice and truth and goodness. This is what we're trying to do all through our life of discipleship. And the more courageously we respond to Christ's call, uh, the, more, the, more, the more blessings we will experience from him. The more generous our reception of the Lord, the greater will be our joy.